Exodus 20, hear the word of the Lord this morning. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Skipping down to verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land and the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's spouse or his male or female servant his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, would you reveal to us your family through this scripture your truth. Guide my words to reflect your truth. Speak to each heart gathered here. Heavenly Father, would you help all we hear, say, do, and pray this morning to lead us closer to your son, Jesus. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you may not know it by looking at me, but when I was a junior in high school, I had the privilege of playing high school football. And I I do air quotes there because I rode the bench as fifth string of five strings of safety. So I was either number nine or ten, out of our 10 safeties. Um, when you're fifth string, it's, you don't really know. And I loved playing football. I kind of got into it. I was homeschooled, went to public school. A friend of mine said, hey, let's go out for the football team. And I said, let's do that. And then I did, and he never did. But I made some friends in the weight room and, and didn't realize how hard it would be for me to hit people. And I mean, I was terrible at football, guys. They called me stone hands. I couldn't catch. They wouldn't throw it to me in warm-up drills on game day. It was terrible. But I had a great experience, and part of that was the coaches we had. There's something about a coach that just, there's so much potential for them to impact someone's life. Because leading people is hard, y'all. I don't know if you know that. But training the people you lead is harder. And training them to do something you aren't allowed to step in and do for them is really difficult. So a coach has to train you and lead you, and they can't shove you out of the way and say, let me just do it myself. They have to get you to a place where they can put all their confidence in you, and that means that they're very invested in you, very invested in you. Well, I chose my position group. I chose to be a a defensive back purely because the coach I knew the most was Coach Spot. Coach Spot had been the guy in the weight room after school, so I kind of got to know him. He was one of our DB coaches. I think he was the cornerback coach, so he wasn't really my coach. But he played college football. He knew a lot. And, I mean, the dude was just built. He could outbench every defensive back. He was strong. He was quick. And he was was fun. He was nice. He would yell a lot. He was a great guy. I loved Coach Spot. But one of the things we would do at practice is we would kind of face off against the wide receivers, and we would do drills. And the way it worked was if they scored more, times then we stopped them we had to do punishment conditioning which is just you have to run extra or do crab crawls or bear crawls or or some sort of extra fitness activity after everyone else has gone home because you lost well coach spot would do all of these with us he would coach us he'd watch us mess up we would lose 
The wide receivers would go home, grab their glass of chocolate milk off the sideline and get in their cars, and we would be there crawling around the turf late after practice, melting the skin off our hands because the turf was so hot, and he would do it too. He led by example. And part of that was because he was physically capable of anything he would have asked us to do. There was no part of our, our training and our practicing that he couldn't do himself. He just couldn't play. So he wasn't asking us to do something he wasn't willing to do. He led by example. He was capable of, or I could put it this way, he was free to run as fast or as hard and to lift as much or as heavy as we do. Well, as I reflect on that, that idea of having the physical freedom to do what you want to do, I think of something that I heard Dr. Tim Gaines say at camp this last summer. He's a professor, so he'll ask his college students. He'll look at them. He's a runner, too. He's a distance runner. So he'll look at them and say, hey, are you free this afternoon to run 10 miles with me? And they'll say, well, I mean, yeah, class gets out at 3. I mean, if it's after that, yeah, I can do that. And he said, no, no, you may have the time. Do you have the time to run? Sure. But are you actually free to run 10 miles today? Are you actually free to do that? If you chose to do it, could you do it? This is something that's been fresh in my mind, training for a marathon. I may have had the time to run a marathon five or six hours on a Sunday, but was I really free to do it without doing the training? Now we won't know until I do or don't finish that marathon next week, but I, I think you get my point. If we're going to lead by example, if we're going to live certain lifestyles, we need to actually be free to do so. But we have to give ourselves to the discipline necessary to become someone who's free to make those choices. I'm maybe getting ahead of myself, but if you're having trouble converting training for running and football over to our lives as Christians, think of anger. You may be free to remain calm when someone pushes your buttons, but if you have not put the practices in place to condition yourself into a person of serenity and peace, you are not actually free to be kind in that moment. You're a slave to that anger. You could take that analogy and apply it a million different ways, right? So that's kind of, you feel where we're going. Well, here's, here's the beautiful thing and the challenging thing about our story today. Just like we just sang about being, no longer being slaves to fear, the people of God, God's family, were no longer slaves in Egypt. No, we're not talking metaphorical slaves. They were literally slaves in Egypt. And they've been set free from that. Some of the language from the song, God split the sea so we could walk through it. We're taking that as a metaphor for our hearts and lives. But for these people, that's what happened. The sea was split. They escaped. They were set free from bondage. They no longer belonged to Pharaoh. They belonged to God. A loving God. Not a cruel God. A loving God. And this story is important for us because... If you read in the New Testament where Jesus, the Son of God, speaks, he takes the story of Exodus as an analogy for our freedom from sin. We were once slaves to fear, sin, death, anger, frustration, selfishness, anything that you can think of that's not loving. We were once slaves to that, but through Christ's death and resurrection, we've been set free. We understand that just as God saved the Israelites from Egypt, God saves his family, the church, from sin and death. Sometimes we think of that as just a heaven one day reality, but I have to tell you the good news is better than that. God desires to bring change to our hearts and lives now. He doesn't just want to give you a ticket to heaven. God's Holy Spirit wants to transform us from the inside out and set us free from sin. Not just forgive us for it. So maybe more than any other story we've told in this series on the family of God, this story is important because when God says in the future, your children will say, what's the meaning of these laws and commandments? We just read the Ten Commandments. What's the meaning of this? What's the meaning of all these decrees and laws? And if you read Exodus, there's another ten chapters of commandments after this. 
What's the purpose of these? And you look at your child and say, we were once slaves in Egypt. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. So when your kid says, why don't we watch those kind of movies? And you say, son, we were once slaves to anger and lust and idolatry, but now we're free from that. That's why we don't live that way. Just, we're going we're gonna to keep working through this, but just to paint the picture of why this story is so critical, that language maps right over to our life of faith, doesn't it? It's being set free from an oppressor we could not resist on our own to live as the family of God. That is our story too. But here's the challenge. Did freedom from slavery mean that the Israelites, God's family, were immediately able to live a truly free life? Did being released from Pharaoh's cruel ownership of them to the wilderness mean they were now free to always live the way God wanted them to? Were they suddenly perfect? Were they suddenly kind beyond reckoning? Were they suddenly not angry or selfish or scared? Were they immediately completely free? Because if so, why do they need rules? Why do they need commandments if they're able to act lovingly all the time without help? If they're actually free to be the people of God, why do they need rules? It's a fair question to ask. I would say that the fact that there's these rules in here is evidence that they were not immediately free to live and act and be the family of God the way God had called them. It was going to take some time. They needed to be shaped into a different kind of family. They needed to have an entirely different way of life than the one that they used to have in Egypt. It was going to be different than anything they'd ever seen or experienced. This is a drastic change for them. Now here's here's some of the tension for us. We believe in what we call the optimism of grace. We believe that God's grace outpaces any brokenness and any sin and any mistake we could make. There's more grace than there is condemnation. And read the letters in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul is all over this stuff. We believe by the grace of God that we can have a pure heart in an instant. We can have good intentions almost instantly. We can have that eye-opening moment at the altar or as we sing and go, wow, I'm no longer a slave to fear. And we can instantly desire something different. But purity of heart is different than maturity of character. Maturity of character takes time. You may want to be a loving friend the moment you realize Jesus Christ died for you, but are you always free to love everybody as Jesus loved you? Well, maybe not immediately. Maybe that takes some time. Maybe, dare I say it, that takes some rules to follow while we're being shaped into the family of God we're called to be. Because yes, while at any moment, if we say, Jesus, you're all I want, he can fill us with the Holy Spirit and we can be pure, like an innocent child who doesn't mean to do any harm. If we're honest, even when we don't mean to do harm, we do harm. And becoming someone who's fully loving takes time. Maturing into the family of God takes time. I believe it'll take the rest of our lives. We'll continue this journey of grace for the rest of our lives. Let me put it one other way before we move on. We are able to change our intentions quickly, but it takes time to change our habits. We can intend to follow God into the wilderness faithfully in an instant, but can we have the habit of our first instinct being obedience and peace and love without 
working our way to that, without being shaped, without giving ourselves to the discipline of being shaped, like a runner, like a chef, like our coach when I played high school football, who'd given himself to this discipline for years, and now he was free to do what he needed to do. We can change our intentions quickly, but church, if we're honest, it takes time to change our habits. And this is challenging. This is challenging for us because as we look around, especially those of us who've been in church a long time, you may have heard it said, oh, the Bible is just a big book of rules to follow. Or maybe someone who doesn't like rules, they're a little more like self-assured, they're like, ah, you can throw the whole Old Testament out. That's just a bunch of rules. Jesus shows up in the New Testament and he's all love and, and we don't really need to think about our actions any. We can just, you know, feel good and then go to heaven. Sometimes, the, the challenge is with this idea that sometimes we start to think, if we think the rules in here are anything short of an act of love from a loving God, what we will start to think is that these commands of God are a way for us to repay God for saving us. Well, God saved me from slavery in Egypt, so now I've got to pay him back by being a real good boy. i got to be real nice. i got to pay my tithe because God freed me from addiction, and I owe it to God. That's a dangerous way to look at these rules, I will say. That's a dangerous way to interact with the commands of God. Sometimes, for some of us, as we look at the commands of God, we start to think that they're the thing that's stopping us from experiencing the love of God. I mean, I just can't deal with all these rules, Pastor. There's too many rules. I can't wear two fabrics. I can't do this and that. What's this thing about not eating pork? I love going to the barbecue place out by the highway. I just, well, there's too many rules. If God's so loving, why are there so many rules? Church, how many children have asked their parent exactly that haven't all of us why do we have to do this why do I have to brush my teeth mom if you love me I wouldn't have to brush my teeth I don't want to eat vegetables they're gross and they look weird and boiled broccoli smells bad why do we have to do this would well, be silly for you to go you know what Four-year-old, you make a good point. The rules are gone. You've called my bluff. I love you so much. No more rules. Play in the street. Put a fork in the outlet. Do whatever you want. That'd be ridiculous. That would be so unloving as a parent, wouldn't it? But man, doesn't your 16-year-old hate their curfew? Wouldn't it be easier, though less loving, to have no standards for the people we love? Oh, it would be easier to never have a hard conversation with a loved one, wouldn't it? It'd be easier in the short term. Oh, I just don't want to hurt their feelings. But don't you love them? Don't you owe it to them to love them better than just letting them play in the street and run off a bridge? It's difficult because I don't want us to go into the ditch on the other side of the road and follow all the rules so that we can earn God's love. It doesn't work that way. Remember, they've already been freed from slavery. They didn't follow the rules and then get freed. The way of life follows the gift of resurrection life. But here's the reason that these commands are so important. Because God wants us to be a part of his family. He wants us to be free from slavery to sin. If nothing else, these commands teach us the heart of God. They show us what it means to be the family of God. We serve a God who does not want us to kill one another. We serve a God who doesn't want us to be jealous of each other and to steal. We serve a God who doesn't want us to wander off and follow some other idol because that idol does not have our best interest in mind. Now, if I want to walk down the street and feel safe, it's not enough for me to not murder anybody. What do we need? We need a commitment from all of us to not kill one another. So we may say, oh, well, some of these rules are for some of us, but not all of us. Well, if some of us can get away with murder, none of us are safe. 
to make it more practical, but maybe a little more silly here, if you want to be free to grab the cup or the bowl or the measuring cup you need whenever you want, your family needs to be committed to some sort of way of keeping the dishes clean. None of you are free to get a cup and drink some water if none of us give ourselves to the discipline of washing dishes. And the spouse who washes the dishes said, amen. We get this intuitively. All of us understand this in every part of life. Are you free to feel good in your body if you eat Taco Bell 14 times a week? Everyone would go, well, no. But then I say, okay, so let's, let's give ourselves to the discipline of the scriptures. And we go, ah, there's so many rules in the Bible. Every other part of our life we get this. But when we do look at it in the scripture, the enemy wants to cloud this with shame and anxiety Rather than showing us that this is the life of freedom that God is describing, the enemy wants us, the enemy of your soul wants you to think this is a laundry list to measure up and buy back God's love. That is not what these commands are. Why does God give us these commands? Well, for one thing, I believe it's that God knows we make a lot of choices. And God knows there are some choices that do not lead us to freedom. There are some choices that do not actually let us experience a free life in the family of God. And I jumped over these verses earlier, but I'm going to address them because all y'all who are reading along, these are some troubling verses and we got to look at them here. There's ways of living that don't lead to freedom. God knows the damage that human sin can cause. He knows the cost of sin is death. In verse 5, Exodus 50, verse 5, you shall not bow down to these other gods or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. The reason I read that is I know some of y'all did as we were going past it, and it's a troubling passage, and I want to unpack it a little bit. I do not believe in this text that God is prescribing a punishment. I do not see in this text, and some, some people may disagree on this, I don't see in these verses God saying, I'm so vindictive that if you cuss, I will smite your great-grandchildren. I believe that God is describing for his family the consequence of sin. And when we hear Jesus' brother, James, writing about this in the New Testament, James chapter 1, verse 13, we get this picture gets rounded out for us. When we're tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then, after desires conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. So the Israelites, it's written this way. It could be very anxiety-inducing. Oh my goodness, if I sin, God will smite my grandchildren. But James we got to remember the whole Bible together is having a conversation. James says, no, no, no. Sin does the killing. Sin is the thing that ruins your great-grandchildren's life. We call these generational curses. There are many ways that you could return to slavery in Egypt, and it would hurt your family. God is not vindictively smiting them for your sins. And how do we know that? Look at the difference. Yeah, sure, maybe your sin will affect your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids. But when you are loving, God shows love for a thousand generations. What did I say earlier? The love and grace of God outpaces the brokenness of the world. So even though our sin may hurt our families, the sins of our church could have hurt this church for hundreds of years, they will not get the final say. The grace of God is bigger. And this is the only reason that we are able to boldly step into parenting. 
Because God's grace is bigger than our mistakes. God's grace outpaces our inadequacies as parents, as spouses, as friends, as board members, as coworkers. God is not saying if you are unfriendly to your coworker, I will smite your whole office. He's saying if you live like you're still a slave to sin, death is contagious. But the love of God is more contagious. So I said earlier, as we prayed, we want to pass the faith on from generation to generation. This is why we can't afford to be soft on sin. In the church, we've gotten a little soft on sin because we emphasize, and rightfully so, that God loves you. But church, we need to name the fact that God loves the people in our lives. If I say, well, you know, just stay an alcoholic, it's all right, bud, because God loves you, how is that loving to your kids? God is naming a dynamic here. God's not saying, I'm going to walk around with a stick and, and get to you by punishing the ones you love. God is saying, listen, you didn't used to have control over the life of your kids and future generations. You were slaves. But now that you're free, your actions have consequences. And not just for yourself. For everyone you know and everyone generations from now, we have a ripple effect. So before we throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, there's too many rules in this Bible, well, God loves people other than you. We need these rules. Why? Because, well, you know, God will forgive you if you kill somebody. That's true, but he wants them to not get killed. Do we understand that? Can we see that it is uncharitable of us, unloving of us, to throw the rules out and just enjoy that God forgives us? That is so selfish. It's dangerous. It has far-reaching consequences. Generational curses can hurt our children. Drugs and alcohol, yes, they hurt us. And yes, there's grace. And yes, God wants to bring resurrection life that diffuses the shame. But we cannot pretend the shame isn't there so much that we never change and we just keep hurting other people. Anger is like this. Anger gets passed on generationally. Lying is like this. Some kids learn to lie at a very young age. I did. I was lying as early as I could talk. Abuse is like this. Gossip is like this. Do you know that when you're sitting around the table at Applebee's after church, your kids and your grandkids and your spouse are listening to the way you talk and they're learning from it? When you complain about your boss and when you complain about other drivers... People are watching. They're learning what it's okay for a person in the family of God to do. When we're selfish, oh my goodness, selfishness is generational, isn't it? Maybe more than anything else, selfishness is generational. So is neglect. If we neglect each other, then we'll become so distant, we'll just slowly, we'll just keep adding chairs and we can all scoot further and further away until we're sitting nowhere near each other in church on Sunday and maybe we're just watching online. Greed is generational. These sins go against the deep desire of God, which is what? God wants us to be free. The sin in our hearts can destroy us and our children for generations. Now, when the grace of God enters in, the math is in the favor of the grace of God. You know, three or four generations Thousands of generations. God's grace is bigger. We don't need to despair the mistakes we've made. But church, if we are living for Jesus, we need to take seriously what we do with the rest of our time on this earth. And I'm just as in need of this truth today as any one of us. This is not me saying, I figured it out. Y'all better figure it out. We need to constantly, not, not necessarily constantly, we need to often, every so often, reflect on our lives. Are they as loving as they can be to our neighbors? And if we're killing people and stealing and envious and selfish and lying, they are not loving to our neighbors. So church, I'm convinced that these rules are good news. God doesn't say, hey, you know, you ought to be free. Figure it out yourselves. He doesn't say, stop being angry, whatever that means. He gets specific. He gets personal. 
He takes these Ten Commandments and he spreads them out over the next ten chapters with very detailed things. Detailed ways to love your neighbors. And do we have to follow all of them to a T? No, but the spirit of those laws is good. One of them is when you build a house that has a flat roof, put a fence on the roof. Because if someone falls off of the roof because you were too lazy of a builder to put a fence on it, that's your fault. You need to love in advance and prepare to love other people well. That's just one example. We got examples of, hey, when your neighbor's ox falls in the ditch, help them get it out. Why? Because that's how they plow their field. Their food might go bad. Your neighbor might go hungry. It's not saying that all of us should do these specific things, but the commands of God describe a way of life, and the options are quite simple. We are slaves, or we are living the way God has called us to. There's not a middle space. There's not, well, you know, I, I'll just keep being selfish and hurting the people around me, and then just, you know, enjoy how good it feels to be loved by God. Yes, God's grace will let you do that, but can I say that is a cheap grace. And you'll, you will regret that grace in heaven when you realize you could have participated in what God was doing even more. Church, the good news is that God's commandments show us what it means to live a life that is truly free. Following God's commands is the only way to be truly free. Now, we may want to do whatever our impulses tell us, but can I tell you that many of us are slaves to anger and fear and greed, and we're not really free. We may like making our own rules, but we're not much more free by ignoring God's rules and following our own. You hear it said a lot in our culture, do they follow your heart? Well, I'd rather follow God. We're not called to follow our heart. We're called to follow Jesus. And those things are not always the same. Much like a runner training for a marathon. You may be free next Sunday afternoon, but man, if you haven't trained, you probably can't go run the Detroit Free Press Marathon. You're not actually free to do that. Like a chef learning to cook. You may be free to go make any dish you want tonight, but can I get an amen for the fact that it might not go well? If you haven't given yourself to the discipline of learning to be truly free as a chef. You might be free to move to France and speak French with everybody, but are you truly free if you've not given yourself to the study of that language? You might be free to walk past me and grab Jason's guitar, but are you actually free to play that music if you haven't given yourself to the rules and disciplines of learning to play guitar? You may be free to put a new deck on the back of the parsonage, but can I tell you, if you've never been a carpenter's apprentice, you probably aren't free to build a good deck that'll last more than a winter. You may be free to become a teacher in public schools, but can I tell you, if you've never studied how young people learn, you're not actually free to teach them anything. You're just free to talk and run your mouth and send them home. We are not free until we are formed. Let me say that again. We are not truly free until we've been truly formed. And God does not abandon us to figure that out ourselves. He gives us the scripture to form our lives around. My youth pastor, when I was growing up, similar sermon, shared it this way. If you think about a fish, if you took a fish and you, know, you asked it, you know, like, fish, where do you want to go? And the fish said, I'd like to go on the land. I've never been on the land. I'm sick and tired. My mom always said, I can't go on the land. I want to go on the land. You put that fish on the land, is that fish free or is it dead? The fish is only free in the water. We are only free when we live faithfully within the will of God. God's commandments are for us like water for fish. The beautiful thing is, that the prophets say that God will write this law on our hearts. Does that mean we don't need the written version? No. It just means that the Holy Spirit will be accompanying us so we can actually live this out. That does not mean, well, you know, follow my heart. The Holy Spirit's in there. I'm just going to throw the whole Bible away. No. If our hearts are formed by God, if we are pure in heart and we want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, then we need to be mature in character by giving ourselves to these disciplines. Just like water is the right environment for a fish, the commandments of God is the right environment for us, the only environment for us to truly live. 
We can pretend to live. We can pretend to have eternal life and just wait till we're at the end and hope that we remember to pray the prayer in a hospital bed somewhere. But if this freedom is meant for everyone, if we are committed to the family of God growing, we need to resist the temptation to throw out the rules so that it's even easier to live as the family of God. Now, everyone's welcome. Remember, God freed them before they'd been formed. So I'm not saying that the commands of God are a way for us to gatekeep life in the church. But we are kidding ourselves. If we think life in the church means anything, if we're not any different than when we got here. That's what makes church so tough. Church is a terrible product. Can I just say, my job as your pastor is to remind you that you need to change. All of us for the rest of our lives, every single week. So if you go find a church that lets you be the way you are, my goodness, is it a church? I don't think so. I don't think so. This is meant for everybody. And how do we know that God's always meant it for everybody? Because he looks at these Israelites and he says to them, verse 10, on the seventh day is a Sabbath of, to the Lord your God. On it you shall do, not do any work. Not you, not your sons and daughters, not your male and female servants, not your animals, or any foreigners who happen to be in town. God doesn't say, you follow my rules and you get the blessing. God says, I want to invite everyone into this way of life. And if you don't live this way of life, where are they supposed to join up? If God wants everyone to be a part of the family of God and none of us are living like the family of God, where can they go? Where can your neighbor go to enjoy God's love if we don't live in light of God's love? The way that we share the beauty of this freedom is by living a life that is formed by the commands of God. This is how the rest of the world gets to know that this other way of life is possible. When we embrace what it means to be a part of God's family, our lives show a watching world what true freedom looks like. Church, I know this is a hard word. For those of us that are perfectionists, or as I describe myself, a recovering legalist, a rules guy, this is a hard word. Because man, we, would, we are in danger of going to the ditch on the other side of the road, and we may not be lazy anymore in our faith, but we might be so critical of ourselves, there's no real freedom there. The religious rulers who crucified Jesus lived that way. But that same Jesus said he did not come to remove a single pen stroke of the law. He came to fulfill it. God still wants God's church to live the way God's called them to. God's still inviting us into that. Now church, we can come as we are. But can I say to us, the Holy Spirit doesn't want us to stay that way. They had the slave mindset. They wanted to go back to Egypt. And God had grace for that. If you have trouble believing that, listen to the last three sermons. These are the orneriest, most despicable people, most ungrateful. God had grace for them. But he loved them so much, he said, there's a better way. There's a better way. That's the gospel. And that's Jesus. And because Jesus wouldn't throw out the Old Testament, that means it is also the commands of God throughout the scripture. This is a tall call that God's placed on us. And I know it's heavy. But if we love the world God's placed us in, then we are invited to be faithful to living a loving life. That does not mean always giving people what they want. That doesn't mean always getting what we want. If you've been in church a long time, you know that it's not really about getting what you want. But if we aren't living a different way of life, what do we even have to invite them into? If I preach the truth this morning, church, if I have, would you say amen? That's helpful for me to 
to know that I'm, I'm saying what needs to be heard. I'm going to invite you into a posture of prayer. That may be at these altars. That may be standing. That may be kneeling at your seat. Whatever posture you need to take to pray, we're going to pray together. Because we can't do this without God's Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me, church? Heavenly Father, we confess that we aren't able to measure up to these rules ourselves. For some of us, we confess that we've been trying so hard to measure up for so long that it's exhausted us. That now we're struggling to be kind to other people and we, are, we become critical and cynical. God, for some of us, we confess that we've enjoyed your love without responding to it in obedience for a long time. But God, we want so desperately to be a church that is filled with your Holy Spirit and filled with your love for the, your good world around us. We want that so desperately and we are convinced that shaping our life around your truth is the only way to truly love you and to love each other and to love your world. So God, we ask, would you pour out your Holy Spirit in our midst, in our hearts? We cannot do this on our own. If you convince us that this is important, but you don't fill us to live it out, we'll be doomed. God, we place our hope in the gift of your Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out. God, we thank you for the gift of a pure heart. We thank you that you enable us by your grace to respond to you and to change our mind and our intentions. But God, we plead with you to change our actions, to guide us day by day to live more like you want us to, to be your family. And God, this morning we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would rebuke the voice of the enemy in our minds that tries to bring shame rather than hope and tries to bring anxiety rather than excitement at the thought of living a changed life. God, it is a gift to be in your family. It is a privilege to live the loving life you call us to. Seal within us that truth that we would not despair when it's difficult, that we would not give up, that we would continue to run the race set out for us. And that we would know that honoring you with our lives is the most loving thing we could do for our neighbor. Thank you for freeing us. Continue to free us day by day. And help us to see the people around us not as, not as someone who needs to finish the checklist to earn your love. Just like you lovingly save us from the slavery of sin, would we love people even before their lives have changed? And would we commit to loving them so well that we allow you to change our minds and our lives again and again? Fill your church for this work, Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, thank you that you lead the way for us to follow. Help us to follow you this week, we pray, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Church, I invite you to stand with me as we leave you with a blessing. I you take a posture of receiving. I will not be at the door to greet all of you on the way out. I do, I was long-winded and I do have a flight to make. I love being your pastor. I love the community God's shaping us into. With that in mind, church, would you receive this blessing? As you go this week, may you know the gift of freedom in your heart and in your life. May you be reminded every day that God is inviting you deeper and deeper into the life he's called you to. May the Holy Spirit preserve your heart from the attacks of the enemy as you receive the grace of God and are transformed by it. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Church, God's name rests on you. Be blessed. Go in peace. We'll see you next week.